Howell, Pressburger, Technicolor. The Holy Trinity. This is a matter of life and death. Hey everybody, welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two entertainment assistants go through the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. This week we just happen to be at the bottom of the list because we ping pong back and forth between the top and the bottom. This week we're at number 90. This is Powell and Pressburger's A Matter of Life and Death. Jackie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. We I'm just, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm sipping on a glass of wine here that you, uh, that you brought over from San Simeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, it all ties back drove because all the way there. That's where Hearst Castle is, which so ties into our Citizen Kane episode. So yeah. boom, we just made a connection. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. See ya. Um, Greg, how are you? How was your week? <laughs> <laughs> it was good. <laughs> what did you watch this week? Uh a couple things. Um I saw a movie that we did for the film club called Krakatoa East of Java which is most famous for having a geographical error in its title because Krakatoa is actually west of Java, but the producers thought East sounded more exotic. No way. (laughs) It's a big 60s Cinerama movie, uh, sort of disaster movie. That's I had a lot of fun with. It's very 60s. It's very, there's a lot of cool model work in it and stuff. The characters are are like a little thin, but they're trying. And I had a good time with it Uh, because I wanted to do like, we want to do a really fun kind of like mindless movie for the film club because we've been doing a lot of like dour, serious movies. Um, I also saw The Batman, Matt Reeves' Oh, The Batman. At the time of this recording, the newest Batman film with Robert Pattinson. I don't, I don't like to use the word hate, but I hated it. I thought it was it's fair. genuinely terrible. In fact, its very existence offends me. <laughs> I know we try to so like sugarcoat it. things on this podcast, but I just want it to be clear that I truly hated this movie. I mean, yeah, I, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment. But what's so bad about it? I mean, we could talk for a whole episode. It's three hours long, which is completely unnecessary. Uh, it's just it's 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 a whole lot of nothing. It's miscast. It's you don't think you did a good job? No. And you know what? I'm not going to totally throw Matt Reeves under the bus because I liked his uh, Planet of the Apes movies that he did um no this was you know i grew up on batman i kind of like have that rare opinion that like i don't love the nolan batman movies i actually love the tim burton and joel schumacher ones those are like my batman movies and i will defend that to my death like i think the nolan ones are even a little too serious for their own good obviously those i still like the nolan ones but for me batman is you know it's uh it's michael keaton it's uh, Val Kilmer and even George Clooney and what many people consider one of the worst movies of all time. Uh, I really like those Batman movies. They're a ton of fun. Uh, and over the years, Batman has just had the fun sucked out of it more and more and more. <laughs> and this is the ultimate. This is like the furthest you can go with that. This is an emo ass movie. This is literally like, you know, it's it was bad. It's so bad. And I love Paul Dano as an actor. And I think Me as a person... Too. If I knew Paul Dano in real life, I'm pretty sure we'd be friends. I saw him in the Criterion Channel uh, closet video. You know, that's like, a great one. I've seen that. We one. We would be friends. I feel like we're. Yeah. you know, you so, guys remind me of each other. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Thank you. So all respect to Paul Dano. I it just the movie was a complete chore to get through, and worst of all, too, I think socially irresponsible. Uh, just a ve- there's a very there's a scene because basically uh, Paul Dano plays the Riddler in the movie and he's like getting these followers online. He's posting all these like live videos and people are like joining him and he's basically getting a bunch of incels to dress up as the Riddler. And there's like a scene later in the movie where they're kind of like flooding Gotham and they're getting everyone to, to, to come into this big stadium. And all these like Riddler impersonators show up, all these like followers from online and start open firing onto this crowd. And it felt really irresponsible for a franchise they know, like incels. Already has, yeah. Incels love Incidents Batman. Incidents like that. I mean, are we forgetting about the shooting in there's Colorado, literally, there's, right? Was yes, it? exactly. Yeah. There's been multiple like that Joker inspired. That was Dark Knight inspired. Rises? Or? It was Dark Knight Rises, yeah. 
I can't believe that. And I don't think that's the only like Batman inspired shooting. No, people were scared to go see the Joker because they were scared they, there was going to be a shooting. Yeah. So I already wasn't digging this movie. And then to have that scene. That's horrible. It felt really irresponsible. This is a fucking comic book movie and it's taking itself so seriously. And honestly, the biggest offense about it is I think it's trying to be an art film. And so therefore it fails just in every category. Like it's not fun and entertaining as a blockbuster. It has nothing interesting to say. It's not an art film. Certainly not. I don't know if I'm the person to pass judgment on that, but I can say that it's not like artfully done. It's just like, it's like someone watched a lot of moody stuff and tried to emulate it, but it has no heart of its own, no soul. Andy Serkis, who I love, plays Alfred. It's totally miscast. Um, and Colin Farrell plays the penguin. In like with, major with a, you can't even tell it's him. Right? Yeah, and it's like, like what's what's, the point? what is the point? Robert Pattinson was fine. And again, I like him. And Zoe Kravitz was pretty good as Catwoman. But yeah, the movie was a disaster and I hated it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then one last one. Very quickly, I watched a movie called Don't Go in the House. This is kind of a uh, exploitation movie from the 70s famous for being on the UK video nasties list about a guy that abducts women and brings them back to his house and kills them with a flamethrower. This movie had way more soul and character than this Batman movie. <laughs> and I just want to, I'm, I'm bringing it up because the composer for Dunko in the house just happens to be a certain Richard Einhorn who composed the voices of light score for passion wow. of Joan of Arc. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to bring that full circle. So now we've referenced because two episodes at this point. Because everything is full circle, yeah. And we're good. So we yeah. can sign off again. Cool. <laughs> uh, this time for real. This time for real. No, what have you been watching? Um, I've been watching a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to summarize it down. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what to talk about first. I watched A Separation, which is an Iranian movie by Oscar Faradi. And it it, it won Best Foreign Film in like 2011. Mm -hmm. And it's really good. Like, if you want a really good, solid family drama, it's excellent. And it's really interesting because it's about, like, on the surface, it's about this couple who's separating because uh, the wife wants to move to America with their daughter. She wants them all to move to America. They applied for visas. It's time to go. Like, the clock is ticking. They only have 40 days left. But the husband doesn't want to leave because his father has Alzheimer's. You win so, these Alzheimer's movies. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> more. Right, right. Um, so that's happening on the surface, but then like he's accused of causing a woman to have a miscarriage. This it's a long story. I don't want to get into it. So it's like that drama is happening, but that divorce and that separation is like coexisting with this in such a spectacular way, in such a balanced way, where it's like it's never forgotten. It's never just a subplot. And the movie is called A Separation, but it's not really like the divorce doesn't take up that much plot time. And yet it's always there because they have a daughter who's like really affected by it. She stays with the dad and it's really fascinating. It's about a lot of things. It's about like pride and placing the blame on people, not wanting to take responsibility for things but done in a really succinct, small fashion with basically just this family and then the family um, of the woman who miscarried. And yeah, it's great. It's it's really great. It's on Criterion. I just mentioned it because it's leaving this month. Yes. Actually, it might already be gone when you guys <laughs> listen be. to this. That's it, why I watched it because I've funny. been wanting to see it for so long and I saw that it was leaving. I do that all the time. I almost programmed it for the film club and then I saw that it was leaving and I was yeah. like, oh, we don't have time. To yeah, do it. <laughs> but it's great. It really is. Check it out if you can. And then I watched Synecdoche, New York oh, because I hadn't seen it. Uh -huh. And here, and you and my friend Mike, shout out to Mike, both kind of... I don't know, shaded me because I gave three and a half stars on Letterboxd. <laughs> but let me just explain something. I love Charlie Kaufman. And it's it's funny. It's like I have this thing, you know, Uncanny Valley, where it's like if something looks a little too human, but it's not human, you get really weirded out. So I have this Uncanny Valley thing where with this movie and like John Malkovich, they're on one level because they are so brilliant. And they're, they so closely imitate and resemble the feeling and eeriness you have when you're in a dream. It's like Uncanny Valley, but for a dream. When I watch it, I'm like, no, 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 like this is a dream. Like it, it reminds me so much of dreams. 
and the weirdness I feel during dreams that I get really uncomfortable watching them. So it's like this one and John Malkovich are on one level. And because of that, that that kind of uneasiness I have causes me to not really emotionally connect. Hmm. <laughs> right? Is that it's, why you're not a big Lynch fan? Probably. Kind of. No. Yeah. It, it distracts me and I, I don't really connect to those two. But like, give me adaptation. Give me Eternal Sunshine. Give me Anomalisa. Give me even, strangely enough, I'm thinking of ending things. See, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. But let me explain. <laughs> let me explain. Those movies are all, I love all of those movies, and I do, they work for me. The thing about I'm thinking of ending things is it's this weird thing where it's like, it's eerie the whole time and creepy, like on <laughs> purpose, right? So right. it's not like, like with this and Malkovich, it was the way it's so accurately the accurately combined the two constantly like it's like okay with synecdoche it starts out as like a normal movie and then just weird kind of like it sneaks up on you the the weirdness you know but with i'm thinking of ending things it's like i went into that movie knowing that this whole movie is going to be creepy and eerie and weird but i connected with it i really did huh isn't it weird? No, I mean you like what you like, right? It's an I emotional know. response. It's I a know. gut reaction. Sometimes you can't even really justify it. But I recognize yeah. that Snecticky New York is brilliant. And yeah. I'm sure in like five years when I watch it again, I'm gonna love it more. It's a it's a that is a that is a dense movie. I remember seeing that. I was that also kind of tired in, when I watched oh, it. Oh yeah, that's not the right time. Yeah. I saw that in the theater when it came out and I remember thinking just like, oh, I got like ten percent of that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think on a rewatch. But yeah, I mean, with Malkovich, it's like, I don't, something about that movie, like, I don't emotionally connect to that movie. Oh, God. See, that's probably my favorite. Really? Yeah, I think so. And I I know that was his first big movie, but there's, it's so pure. I mean, all of his stuff is pure, but Malkovich More than Eternal Sunshine? Yeah, I think so. I love, I love just how absurd Malkovich is. Um, Yeah. But I love Eternal Sunshine, you know, not, not to pick favorites. I love them both, but. Yeah, so that's it for me. Well, I did watch Five Easy Pieces, but I don't want to get into it because we have so much more to talk about. How are you just now bringing up Five Easy Pieces? Well, okay, because I know you love it so much, and I also really liked it. I loved it, actually. I did. I did love it. But we have so much to talk about. We can't sit here and talk about Five Easy well, Pieces. You could just give the short version. So you love The short it. version is it's another story about a man who can't love yes. and a woman <laughs> telling him it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So it reminded me a lot of Eight and a Half. Yep. In that sense, because we literally just talked about that last week. And yeah, that's that's what I have to say about it. It is brilliant. It's hilarious. I feel like that might be a future <laughs> Personal Prince episode. Let's do maybe. it. I'd love to. And then we yeah. can dive deeper into it. More to come later. With but that for said, now, yeah. let's go to number 90 on the list, A Matter of Life and Death. <laughs> Matter of Life and Death was released in 1946. It is written, directed, and produced by the duo of Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. Cinematography by Jack Cardiff. During the last moments of a plane crash, a British World War II pilot, Peter Carter, makes contact with an American radio operator, June. He says what he believes are his last words to her and jumps without a parachute. To his surprise, Peter lands on a beach in England, unharmed, not far from where June is stationed. The two find each other and immediately fall in love. Shortly after, an 18th century French aristocrat, Conductor 71, comes to inform Peter that it was his job to deliver him to the other world. However, he couldn't find him through all that pesky English fog. When the conductor tries to finish the job, Peter asks for the right to appeal for his life, since circumstances have changed and he is now in love. Meanwhile... June takes Peter to the village doctor, Dr. Frank Reeves, who diagnoses his hallucinations as brain injury and schedules surgery to prevent further damage. They indulge in Peter's delusions because Dr. Reeves asserts that due to his psychosis, Peter's sanity depends on winning the case. I say that in quotes. 
The night of the operation, Dr. Reeves is killed in a motorcycle accident. However, since he's dead, he's able to act as Peter's defense attorney during the trial. Eventually, they win the case by proving that June and Peter would die for each other, a telltale sign of true love. Peter's surgery is a success, and they live happily ever after. It's long, but, like, you can't talk about the movie. A lot happens, yeah. A lot happens. Who's in Um, this picture, anyway? I'll tell you who's in the picture. The (laughs) film stars David Niven as Peter Carter, Kim Hunter as June, Roger Livesey (laughs) as Dr. Reeves. (laughs) We love Roger Livesey. First of all, okay, no. He's Let actually, me finish this He's actually off. a friend of the podcast. He's yes. probably listening right now. And uh, Marius Goring as Conductor 71. And fun fact, Richard Attenborough, who is the man from Jurassic Park. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the man who directed Gandhi. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Is the kid, like, soldier that comes in and says, "This is it's heaven, isn't it? Yeah. Did you know that? I did, yeah. I didn't know that. Brother of David Attenborough, who narrates Planet Earth. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you guys listen to our... Life and death of Colonel Blimp episode, you will know that we love Roger Livesey a I lot. I just realized the, both of these movies have life and death so, in the title. So, yes, I actually made a point of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do I have here? So, the film was released in the U.S. as Stairway to Heaven. Um, it inspired so... the Zeppelin song. Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> just kidding. No, I didn't. I wasn't saying that as like, yeah. Oh, it was okay. just... It was just me trying to... Maybe it did, actually. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah, how would you know? Yeah. Um. But don't you always think it's so funny when they change names for American audiences? They're always dumber. Yeah, because and it was literally because like they didn't want the word death That's in a so movie title. Stupid. It's like, well, were they these like sensitive... I know, but like, were life they these... is good. People are, they're all coming home. Protect yeah, the pure that's... American exactly. ears from death. Like, it's ridiculous. Exactly. I also love, it reminds me of like Philosopher's Stone, for example. They literally changed it yeah. to Sorcerer's Stone because they didn't think that American <laughs> children would know what a philosopher is. Or they would be turned off by. It's really Philosophy funny. I title. always I always love when when titles are changed for American audiences. It's so so funny. So this film came about basically the Ministry of Information had a film commission in England during the war. And the head, his name was Jack Beddington, went up to the archers, the duo of Powell and Pressburger, and basically said like we need a film right now to remind Americans and British people that they like each other. That was it. Yeah. And they were like, what? Okay. Like, I guess we'll do it. Um, Yeah. And apparently this was Powell's favorite movie of theirs. Oh. Isn't that sweet? It is sweet. So the whole thing was shot in, well, or most of it was shot at, uh, in England in Denim Studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, they built that giant staircase. It was literally like a piece of machinery it the, cost 158,000 pounds yeah. at that time, and apparently it was very quiet. I heard it wasn't. I heard they had to dub all of the scenes that take place on the staircase because they couldn't record because oh, it was so loud. I saw an interview with Jack Cardiff, and he really? said it was quiet. Who knows? What? Who knows? We'll never know. <laughs> Interesting. So it has 160 steps, 20 feet wide each step, which is crazy. But yeah. Yeah. What are your what are your initial thoughts about this movie? Initial thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like to use the word hate. I'm no, just kidding. Oh um, my god. This is my second time seeing it. I'd I'd only seen this for the first time in 2018. Again, I only know that because I logged in on Letterboxd. And at the time I said something like, um, this is great. Like the fact that this is my least favorite of the Powell Pressburgers I've seen is like a, a real testament to their work because this movie's great. And I guess I kind of still stand by that. But so I liked it a lot the first time I saw it. I still, I almost liked it more the second time. Um, and I think just because their work puts such a smile on my face. I mean, we both gushed so much over Colonel Blimp. We love, I love the archers. They're one of my favorite, favorite directors, period. Like their string in the 40s mm-hmm. is amazing. And uh, like Black Narcissus and Red Shoes those are, and Colonel Blimp, those are some of my favorite movies of all time. So I don't think that this quite reaches the lofty heights of, as those movies. But what I do think this movie has, and it gives it its own flavor, is it's certain a certain simplicity. 
Mm-hmm. And all of their movies, to a certain extent, are kind of like fables. This one, though, is almost the most fable-like of all of them. It's not the most whimsical. It's not the most fantastic. You can look at Tales of Hop and you can look at The Red Shoes. But what this movie has is a very, very simple story. It's like an hour and 40 minutes long. You know, a lot of their movies, like Colonel Blimp is like pushing three hours and stuff. Like they have a lot of longer movies. This is short. It's concise. And the, the central romance is a really sweet one. Again, we we don't, you know, it's because it's all longing. You know, it's the whole mm-hmm. thing is longing. And then there's this beautiful... And I mean the look of the movie. And I'll I'll talk about Jack Cardiff in a second. But to summarize my final thoughts, I, I love the movie. I think it's I think it's amazing. Um I think it's one of the most beautiful looking movies ever made. And it's really sweet and it, it's it's such a of all their movies, I think it's the best kind of like escapist movie. Yeah. You know, like but but the difference is you compare this to something like Wizard of Oz which is a little bit more straightforward. Like I can see why maybe this wasn't like a huge success in the U S because it's a little, it's a little thinky, right? Because mm-hmm. they're thinky mm-hmm. and it's like just the right amount to kind of elevate it from just like a exactly. simple love story. And yes, it's a smart movie. It's intellectual. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. I think this is like a, this is like an after dinner mint of a movie. <laughs> it is. It is. It <laughs> what really about you? Is. So literally my first initial thought was like, okay, matter of life and death, life and death of Colonel Blimp. These are really dismal titles for such life affirming movies. Yeah, It's so funny. And then I started reading into it and it's like, well, okay. So like everyone in this movie, and this is something I noticed like the first time I saw it, this is my second time seeing it. I just watched it like a few months ago. Um, <laughs> but everyone in this movie is so happy. Like Peter, especially, he's confident. He's never cocky. He's never smug. But he has this kind of skip in his step. Like he's just happy to be there. He's, he's a poet. happy to have. Yeah, he's a poet. He's just happy to have this uh, happen to him, you know? <laughs> and so I started. There's this quote by Michael Powell, and he says, because they were talking about the title and how they changed it for the US. The words life and death were no longer the great contradictions that they had been. They were just facts. So it's like death and darkness. It seems like this was their whole thing. Like death and darkness became a norm for everyone everywhere. But like people still had to have fun. And like I feel like that is what this movie and life and death of Colonel Blimp do and did. And that was their purpose back then. And even today, I mean, how can you not enjoy it? It's it's. I don't know. Like rather than be melodramatic because people were surrounded by death, like it did become this normal thing. So it's like, okay, people still need to feel good and they still need comedies, but we can't completely ignore the fact that millions of people are dying. Right. Like it's, it's kind of genius. And, uh, oh, I just love that like mini space documentary that opens the movie. It reminded me of Winnie the Pooh a little bit. Like that voice, that's big, (laughs) isn't it? Like it did. It reminded me of like the opening of Winnie the Pooh. It reminded me. Yeah. I have a note for here. Just the cosmos. I love that opening and I love how sort of patient it is and, and meditative and like an American movie from that time, I feel like would Would never fuss around. Yeah. Bottom line is this is my summary of my initial thought. They have fun with it. Like that is what they do but it's never to the harm of the subject matter because yeah people were being bombarded with this subject matter back then but yeah i think this has to be one of the most delightful and and effervescent movies on the sight and sound list right yeah 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 and it even i mean it opens by saying this is the story of two worlds the one we know and another which exists only in the mind of a young airman whose life and imagination have been violently shaped by war. Like they say it in the beginning, yeah. like that's what's on everyone's mind. That's what everyone is going through. So you know what's funny? This came out in 1946. Do you know what else came out in 1946? It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Damn. Now let's let's look at these two movies. Okay? <laughs> I made a note that this is the British It's a Wonderful Life. It's exactly life. what it is. And I, listen, I love It's a Wonderful Me Life. Too. And I'm not saying Matter of Life and Death is better. But you can see the British sensibility, the European sensibility over the American one. It's a Wonderful Life. As I love it to death. Again, I feel like I have to say it twice. Uh, it's, it's, I'm there with you. It's I totally on the nose. agree. You know, I totally agree. It's, it's kind of manipulative emotionally. It's, but that's why we love it, right? Yes. This takes a very similar story. And it's much smarter. And it's more nuanced. It's more thoughtful. Yes. And again, not saying that 
equates to being better. It's just too, it's interesting to look at the two different takes. And here's the thing. Let me because I have this whole section where it's like I thought about it like this. It does have these little moments, these little details that save it from being this conventional movie. And I don't know. It's like whether they just bring in reality at moments or add an element or make you think for a minute. It just adds that Powell and Pressburger charm, that yes. magic. Like it's it really magic. does. That's the best way to like, describe it. Yeah. Okay. Like for example, when um, oh, when Peter wakes up on the beach, and he like walks and he thinks he's in heaven. Well, first off, he's not sunburned, which he would have been if it was real life from laying out in the sun all day. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> He, and there's a dog and he goes, oh, I always hope there'd be dogs. Like, it's just like little things like that. Yeah. And then he sees that naked little boy. Okay, let's talk about that briefly. Can we briefly. please yeah. talk about that briefly? What the yeah, fuck? You know, what? That was, uh, <laughs> there's a naked child in this movie. Why? A who, goat herd. And it's not even like a little kid, like a two-year-old kid where like you see his butt because he's running away. It's like a naked, like, yeah. what, nine-year-old yeah. kid? Is he like nine? Maybe seven? I don't know. Younger. Uh, and he's just what sitting there. What is he there. doing there? And David Niven kneels and talks to him while this kid is just fully and doesn't naked. question why he's naked. Yeah, that was a little. So maybe, yeah. honestly, maybe it's like a vision. Maybe, maybe that is Peter when he's young. Could That's be, why he's not shocked. Be. Like, sure, it could be. Or there's just a naked ass kid. Anyway, yeah, it's little like things like that. You know? Oh, yeah. I loved the fact that when I first watched it the first kind of person in charge in the other world because you see bob which is his like i don't know one of his fellow soldiers that was in the plane with him who dies like right before he jumps from the plane so when bob is like in heaven the first person the first like authoritarian figure we see is a woman not sister ruth from (laughs) black narcissus the woman in charge who then tells that um, conductor to go down and get Peter, like Uh she's a woman. So when I first saw that, I was like, whoa, God is a woman in this story. Like I thought that was so cool. It's really cool. And then even the flirtation with sister Ruth, like, yeah, I feel like that is a very European sensibility. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's, there's so much. Yeah. Oh, I love, um, Oh, okay. Here's another thing. Yeah, that kind of saves it from convention or just makes you think like just a meditative kind of thing. It's like, I love the moment where Dr. Reeves is telling June like, oh, okay. If he in his mind like loses the trial, then we'll just make up a lie about how he survived. Me and you will uh, have a few drinks and we'll come up with the greatest lie in medical history. And it like lingers for a minute and you can't help but think like... Does Dr. Reeves like her? Are they like, is he in love with her? It's, it's things like that. Like his camera obscura, that weird thing. Like you would never see that. No one would think to add that in this movie. He has this weird camera that I don't even fully understand. You don't know how the, you know what that is though, right? Can you explain it to me? It's like a pinhole camera. So you, we made them in school. It's basically like you cover yourself. Like you can do it if you get like a cardboard box and you cut like a tiny little hole in it. And if it's just like the right size and you, you kind of point it towards the sun and then you have like a blank piece of paper, it'll like project. Basically. Really? Yeah, it's an old technology. It's so neat. So he like yeah. watches the town. Uh-huh. Like what? Yeah. Why are you so cool? What a cool way too to introduce him because to introduce the Roger Livesey character, you don't see him. You get a call. His like housemaid picks up. She's like, yeah. oh, he's fiddling around with his yeah. camera obscura. He's and showing it to the dogs. Showing it to the dogs. And before you even see him, you get a picture of him. It's yeah. great. It's just great. Yeah, it is. It is. And then there's this other moment that I wonder if you noticed. The people at the base, the soldiers and the women who work there, they're putting on a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh-huh. And there's this moment where this girl, this American girl, is like rehearsing. And she just like looks up to this really old painting of this British aristocrat from God knows how many centuries ago. And there's just this moment where she like looks up at her. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's so, it's like, okay, I'm here saying Shakespeare in England. I'm an American girl. And then like she looks up and she sees this old British woman. It's just things like that. It's, yeah. I don't it's know. It's full great. of little yeah. cool details. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. Visual storytelling. <laughs> to the T. <tea>, which <laughs> the we gushed tea. about in our Colonel Blimp episode. This is actually our first, we should note, this is our first episode where we're repeating uh, filmmakers. Yes. Yes. You're right. So This, this is, is the yeah. only other uh, Archer's 
movie on the list. Yeah, so this will be our second and last, unless yeah. we extend to the 250 films. Yes, or if one of us chooses something for a personal print. Personal print, huh? Um, <laughs> let's talk about Technicolor and black and white okay. in this movie. So do, you, so, do you know the Technicolor process? Do you know how that worked? Not really, but I know that color was like added, like painted, right? So it was this huge, unwieldy camera. It's yes. a very special patented process in which it would film, it would take three strips of film at a mm-hmm. time and each film was tinted a different color. Mm-hmm. And when laid on top of each other, you would get this would very get the, lush, yeah. beautiful image. Right. And um, it's funny. So with Technicolor, let's just... So not at all what I described. No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'm thinking like old animation you're thinking yeah and like silent films they would like hand tint stuff i mean a lot of look there's i'm sure they the technicolor process as far as i know and i could be i'm not super knowledgeable i don't think considered like involved like hand tinting but they've done it in like other processes and certainly animation and stuff um but let's just talk quickly or not even quickly let's have a whole segment about jack cardiff the yes. cinematographer he is one of the legendary cinematographers that has ever lived. This was actually his first job as DP, director of photography. No way. So he was an assistant DP on Colonel Blimp, and he just happened to be working on the scene in Colonel Blimp, which we mentioned, which might have been my favorite site, actually, from Colonel Blimp, which is when they're uh, showing the passage of time through the the animal heads mm-hmm, on the walls mm-hmm. as the trophies. He was working on that, and Michael Powell came up to him. He's like, hey, you're going to shoot my next movie. Mm. And so, Matter of Life and Death Big break. was Jack Cardiff's first job as DP. And wow. Jesus Christ, have you seen a more beautiful movie in your life? Besides, like, <laughs> The Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. <laughs> it's like, have you ever? Um, I'll have to think about that. This is just, <laughs> this is an absolutely stunning, stunning looking movie. It is. Um, so, it's funny. Uh, Michael Powell said, this is a quote by him. I was moving into new worlds of light and color after the drab realism and khaki of the war. I needed somebody to take off with me into the future. I gave the whole job to Jack. Oh. So obviously he ended up working with them after this. He did Black Narcissus. He did Red Shoes. And then he went off and did stuff like African Queen and Death yeah. on the Nile and directed a movie called Sons and Lovers, which I've not seen, but it's apparently the thing that he's most proud of in his career. Um, yeah, you can see. Oh, also to note, he was the only or one of the only photographers that Marilyn Monroe trusted to make her look beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Very prolific career. Um, he actually never shot in black and white. So he, when he was coming up, he trained in black and white. But by the time he was DP, because this was his first movie, color was already the rage. And so his first movie was in color. And he actually talks about having to shoot the black and white scenes in the afterlife and like not telling anyone that he'd never shot black and white before. <laughs> Um, that's amazing but yeah it's really interesting so the black and white is the afterlife and the color is the real world it's the opposite of the Wizard of Oz it's the opposite of the Wizard of Oz and that's exactly what Powell said yeah really of like I just wanted to do whatever the opposite of whatever Wizard of Oz but like what is it saying about the I love what it says like about the world yes it's like it's like okay despite like how he said life and death are just facts Mm -hmm. life is still better exactly yeah like because it's not that the afterlife stuff no, looks drab. No, no, no. It's peaceful it's and peaceful. serene. Exactly. And we don't even see... We only get the administrative stuff. Yeah. They give people their wings and then they go off. We don't really know what they see. So we really yeah. only get the administrative stuff. But still, the fact that the world is in color is a really, really beautiful... It's amazing. I yeah, love that. It really is. And and what, they, what they're able to do with matte paintings and miniatures and like the... The look, the special effects of this movie are still stunning. Yeah. From them sitting on the steps looking at all the statues of people that are passing. Incredible. To the, all the wings behind the counter. Oh my and God, like yeah. Them looking through that hole. That hole. Yeah. I was going to say, what about like, um, okay, the eyelid. We're not yes. going to talk about the eyelid. Yeah. The eyelid the with eyelid. the veins. He closes his eye. You see, this is when he's about to have surgery. He closes his eye. You see the vein. And then it kind of just drops down, slowly turns into black and white. Yes. And it's these seamless. crowds. Yes, mm-hmm. seamless. These crowds heading to the hearing. Yeah. It's so, so, so great. Um, and I'm scared we're going to talk about my favorite site. Okay, so well, I'm going <laughs> to... I will... It's important to note, too, that one of the... Um, 
An assistant DP on this movie was Jeffrey Unsworth, who went on to shoot 2001 and Cabaret. Mm. Um, you know, it's so funny. In the one of the first times that we see June, it reminded me a little bit of my favorite sight from Colonel Blimp. Remember my favorite sight where Deborah it's Carr. like. Yes, at the at the red light and the light flashes yes, on her face. Yes. It is so much red like that. Light and it's a, yeah, yeah. I let me just say that the image of June when we first meet her is such a it's a beautiful image that almost was my favorite sight. But her eye is like in shadow, right? And it's kind of like blurry a little haze, bit. There's yeah. some haze and there's a red light behind her and she just looks amazing and it's very like Oh, it's a beautiful image. It's so beautiful. And you can't see where she is. Like, she's in a tower, but you can't really tell. Even that is kind of mystical. Like, where is she? Is she, like... It's like an air traffic control tower. Yeah. And also, yeah, my grandpa was an air traffic controller. Yeah. Think of him. That's really, really sweet. Um, What about... Okay, now I'm jumping ahead, but, like, during the trial, when we just get, like, these incredible shots of just groups of people hanging out waiting for the trial to start like there's quakers yeah there's like old aristocrats yeah there's nurses and you think about it and it's like all those people are dead but even like the modern people who are yeah there there's this huge group of nurses like modern nurses they're either from world war one or world war two yeah, they died in the and they're war. all dead mm-hmm. and then there's the different like regiments and they're all kind of hanging out like because everyone came to see this trial. It's the big, yeah, it's the big but deal. It's so many extras and so many. It's just so fun, like seeing them just all hang around and waiting with each other in these groups. Yeah. And it's interesting the way that they shoot this, too, because not everyone's real. Right. And they're using matte paintings and they're using yeah. stuff to make it look like there's more people. There's yeah, a great, of course. There's a great shot in this movie where there's like uh, there's like circles of light and people are walking through them. It's this huge, it's like an overhead shot. It's looking down at a bunch of people. Yeah. You see some people moving and some people aren't. And yeah. the people that aren't moving are clearly like the matte painting. Part, I think but... that's, that's the part I'm talking about where his eyelids are closing and then it just pan. It's the seamless. It like drops down and then, yeah, you see oh, some people moving, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. 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 Just, it's really, really well done. It's just fun yeah. too. Like it's, this is like, yeah, I mean, how how else can we say it? But like Archer's touch, it's poetic it's, and pretty and also obviously Jack Cardiff. But it's just like, it's everything you want the camera to do when you're watching a movie. Yes. It's so fun. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And speaking of the trial, um, there's a... I mean, it's it's so great, and you, that's where the whole genesis of the movie comes from, is right this like Americans versus British thing, and it's it's yeah. portrayed very like on the nose from this staunch oh my American. God, it's so funny. I love the way that man talks. The first guy that Raymond died, Massey. yeah, the first yeah. guy that died in the American Revolution. He is the um, defense attorney. No, I'm sorry, he is the prosecuting yep. attorney uh-huh. because he hates British people because he's was killed by yeah. British. <laughs> and the way that he talks of good American blood, like he talks like such a like exactly what you think George Washington sounded like. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, the iconic Raymond Massey, and then you've got the most British Roger Livesey <sighs> as the defense. <laughs> <laughs> um but i love that there's a dig on american music like when yes, they turn on the radio yes. and like this is what, what's playing on american yeah. radios right now yeah and it yeah, was like yeah, yeah. very very early almost like rock like blues kind yeah, of yeah yeah and they're like oh i have no idea what he's saying <laughs> neither do i it's so funny and then when that that american the revolutionary guy says like and she has fallen in love with him. And there's this group of like, I don't know if they're like Lutherans or Protestants or Quakers. And they all like, they like lift up their hands. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're like so yeah. affected and <laughs> there's a lot of nice, offended yeah. that like, uh, that they're in love. It's so funny. There's some nice visual gags in that whole it's sequence. It's hilarious. Yeah. This movie is hilarious. Yeah. It, it is. really is. It is. But I want to talk a little bit more about like the other world. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we did kind the of mention world? like no, the other oh, world. Oh, afterlife. The afterlife. Okay. Yes, yes. It's like I I like so I keep calling her sister Ruth because that is who she plays. The do you know the actress's name? That's Kathleen Byron. Yes. Yeah, so I call her sister Ruth because that is her character in Black Narcissus. Yeah. But she is fantastic, and she is kind of this. I, I like how it's not stern. It's never scary, the other world. No. no one is mean. No one, even like during the trial, I feel like. 
everyone is just kind of calm. It's very sterile. It's a very modern environment, sterile. And then there's this beautiful moment where she is explaining to him, like, so she basically always says how, like, everyone is equal here. Someone comes in and asks for, like, officer's quarters, please. And, of course, the Americans are, like, dumbasses. And, <laughs> and she goes, no, no one has that. Like, everyone is equal here. And she says something else. Everyone is allowed to start how they like. She says that, and it's so sweet. And that's when the guy from Jurassic Park turns and says, this is the heaven, guy from isn't Jurassic it? Park. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I'm really sorry. Wasn't he also um, in Bridge on the River Kwai? maybe <laughs> um oh but the no but then again it's like they do it just enough like it's john hammond from heaven, jurassic park if you if you don't know who we're talking about yes <laughs> but they do it just enough like do you get what i'm saying it's like heaven is nice but it's not nicer than earth there's even this great it's just part. different yeah there's this great great part where the, these american soldiers who sound like they're hooligans like come in and they go boy home sure wasn't anything like this and then one of them behind him goes mine was and he's so <laughs> sad yeah it's really sweet yeah anyway um so i like what this so basically 40 years later vin vendors made wings of desire and that does a very similar thing where heaven is black and white and it's quiet and it's this, well, I don't want to say heaven, heaven. It's not, they don't use the word heaven in this movie. Neither do they in this movie. <clears throat> right, right. Exactly. I'm talking about this movie. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. but it's, you know, an afterlife. It's another yeah. existence and Wings of Desire is the same thing. It's black and white yeah. thing. And then I guess spoilers, if you haven't seen Wings of Desire, wait, have you seen Wings of Desire? No. <laughs> what don't say it oh my god i'm not gonna say it you should see it but basically something happens in that movie and then it turns to color okay so you just spoiled it i didn't though you don't know what happens i don't i don't care now i know that it turns to color yeah but you know that even no i don't <laughs> that's not a spoil I, it sounds like a spoil to me listen it's like a 40 year old movie at this point <laughs> Listen. no no it's like 35 listen you got to see that one that's amazing i you, will that and this would actually make a great double feature okay yeah i'm still catching up on the double features from last week what was that like synecdoche kind of oh yeah <laughs> would that have paired well with a oh yeah yeah we it talked was. about it <laughs> right right um okay what do you think about their relationship okay <laughs> it's symbolic like i don't it's think it's exactly. supposed to be yeah it is symbolic he is super charming she's dreamy and stella <laughs> stella <laughs> she's stella she is this is kim hunter yes she is in streetcar named Come desire on, greg I, I temporarily forgot that <laughs> i was like why are you doing brando <laughs> um <laughs> So, um, yeah, so she was a pretty prominent theater uh, yeah. and, and film actress. And I think this is one of her earliest roles. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, she's such a cutie in this. She's great. Um, and I think a lot of it works symbolic. because of their performance. Here's the thing, like, too. We don't get to spend enough time with them. No. As a couple, We it's because the whole movie, from the second they meet, which is over the radio as this plane is going down, yeah. there's something wedged in between them there's yeah. only one scene in which there's not and that's where they're like where they first meet in person and they go oh, and yeah. lay in that like meadow uh -huh. under that tree uh -huh. um that's like the only time that this is not wedged in between them yeah and i think uh, also let me just say this jack cardiff does some of the heavy lifting there mm -hmm. so he is the cinematographer is literally help selling this love story yeah it's not that it's it's not that the love story is written very well it's not that you it's not like they have amazing chemistry but like you said it is symbolic and it's more about two people being pulled apart that can't really come together until yeah. this is like settled you know and the movie wisely ends when it's figured out. yeah 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 but the way i think i think the way that they perform it really helps as well like oh yeah i feel like david sure. niven isn't like taking himself too seriously like the way that he what he, he kind of has an effortless charm do you know yes he you know, does he's one of the i don't know how many actors he's a, he played james bond yeah 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 wait i did know this in casino royale in 1967 yeah yeah briefly <laughs> briefly but he's technically a bond it's the way that he didn't he... get his own movie but he's technically a bond yeah interesting yeah but he does have that like James Bond kind of like just casual yeah. like I don't know he's great. Yeah. My only complaint is that June. I guess they both do. 
They say darling way too much. Well, this is the 40s. Another drink, darling. <laughs> it's oh, thank British. you, darling. <laughs> She's not British. She oh, that's says true. it She's every yeah. sentence. Well, they're every in love. Sentence. How else would people know that they're in love? It, anyway, you know what I love? There's this great line where Dr. Reeve says, I think he's fascinating. And June says, so do I. And he goes, not biologically, medically. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. He just has to prove he's uh, no okay. homo. But come on, come on, Roger Livesey. Roger Livesey. Like, how can you even... <sighs> Making a return from Colonel Blimp. How can you, honestly, I can't believe she's she's let him go all these years. <laughs> it's a very platonic... She, why? Like Why? What's what? wrong with him? He's Nothing. In, he's into the dogs. He's perfect. He's perfect. A motorcycle riding doctor... With a beard and dogs. Here's the thing. The motorcycle thing, that's not a good trait. That's not attractive. It's dumb. People die on motorcycles all the time. No offense if you ride a motorcycle. Okay. That's how he dies in the movie. But he looks great. <laughs> he looks great as and he dies. he's smart. <laughs> and he's suave. And he plays ping pong. There's also a very prominent motorcycle scene in Colonel Blimp. Yes, I thought of that, actually. Yeah. I love the way that he's shot, too, on the bike. Like, he's clearly, at least the first time you see him, it doesn't appear like he's in front of a rear projection screen no. or something. It looks like he's actually riding, yeah. or he's being towed in on, like, a real stretch uh -huh. of road, which is nice. When he crashes, though, it is super close up. Yeah, yeah. you can tell um, it's, like, not moving. Yeah. But, yeah, Poor that's... Poor guy. You know, honestly, <laughs> they don't mourn him enough. Well, because it's bittersweet, right? Because he dies, he now gets to represent Peter in the afterlife. I'm going to miss him, though. Yeah, I know. I'll miss him, too. <laughs> Favorite character. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Or the French guy. The French guy. <laughs> the French guy. <laughs> What's his name again? Uh, Conductor 71. Yeah, he's he's delightful. Uh, he's kind of the Clarence of this movie. He is so funny. He is the Clarence <laughs> of this movie. But yeah. honestly, I like him way more. Than Clarence? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He's so funny. I love how he's like, oh, Shelly and like, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of good jokes with him. Like, is he? I'm pretty sure he's gay. Like, in the story. Yeah, I mean, it's the 40s, so they couldn't say anything. But it's just like he plays him so well. So uh, his name is Marius Goring. I, I didn't know people were actually named Marius. I thought that was just a Haven't you seen? Like, oh, I was about to say. I was just, seen yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> And he's in the red shoes and he's like the romantic lead in the red shoes. Yeah. So seeing him in this is so funny. Like yeah. the fact that he can do comedy so well and he's great in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and he great. has the famous line. It's, we're lacking in Technicolor up there. That is a famous line. And American American critics thought that was like hilarious. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. Like they thought that that was a radical. A little fourth and wall it break is, for you. It is great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I remember see when I saw that for the first time, I, I thought, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> it is. It, it is. is. Like now that that kind of thing is dime a dozen, but for yes. 1946. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Clever. Yeah. Totally. Um, well, let's just talk about like Peter's mind, right? Because like there's a lot of movies like this where it's like no answer, right? Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, what's real and what's not real. There's no right answer. You can decide right. for yourself what you want to believe. Um, but there's evidence for both sides. Like, there's a lot of movies like this. Yeah. But what I like about this one is that they're, like, mutually inclusive. Like, it's the fact that the doctor validates him and actually believes that this is happening in his mind. And yes. it's it's a very tender way of, like, representing brain injury and mental mm -hmm. health and PTSD. I think it's really tenderly done. And I, I, I love it. Yeah. And they, they have to work together. Yeah. Like, here, like, it's kind of like, yeah, the success of the surgery is connected to the case. Like, they're happening at the same time. But it's like, Dr. Reeves knows that he's hallucinating, but they don't treat him like a crazy person. They, they actually... Well, he is a neurologist. Yeah, yeah, but they actually, like... I don't know. I just like how no, they no. do it. Do, am, I, am I making sense? No, no, no. You are completely. I get it. And because a lot of movies will waste time if someone's claiming some lofty thing of like, 
And here's where here's where the archers are smart. Someone's claiming some lofty thing, some fantastic thing. Mm-hmm. They're doubted the whole movie yes. until the end where they're not. Yes. But because the archers introduce him to a doctor of yes. brain, yes. a neurologist. Yes. He, he never doubts him because he's like, you have sustained a serious injury and I'm sure and there's something wrong with you. he had the concussion six months before this. Yeah. And like, it is kind of when the first time he sees that conductor and then he, he, he comes out of the trans and he wakes up and he like, he really loses his shit for a second. He's like, June, June, are you here? And you see like a POV what he's seeing and it's like blurred. Mm-hmm. It's actually blurred, like an actual concussion patient. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It is brilliant. It really is. And then, of course, like, there's the more practical stuff that, like, it is easier. I mean, here's the thing. Do you think that it is kind of a it could go both ways situation here? Because I don't think it actually is. I think it is very clearly happening in his mind. I know that Michael Powell said he wanted it to be open to both. Right. But Um, then why would they start it with literally the quote is, about the two worlds, the right. one we know and the other which exists only in the mind of a young airman. That's how they start the movie. Yeah, I know. But I, I, I don't know. I don't take that so... I, again, I know we've talked about this before, but I'm one of those people who always likes to believe that the fantastical thing is actually real and happening. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm going with that. It's real. There was an afterlife. Because look, otherwise, it's really sad that Roger Livesey dies in this motorcycle accident and then he's just dead. <laughs> At least in this way, they get to see him again, and he gets to fight for him and have this beautiful goodbye. So it's yeah. real. I'm saying it's real. What about... Okay, but what, then this is the argument everyone always uses. And I like how in the end, like, June is just silent. It's not like... So you, if she talked a little more, if there was one more conversation, it would be more clear that she actually... Like, they summoned her up there for some reason, and she, like was about to give her life, right? When they but come back, just... she's very knowing, though. Like, she is has she... just been there. I got that impression. No. I got that impression. She picks up the book. She's like, hmm? The mm. chess book. The chess! The chess. I forgot yeah. to mention! Yeah. Okay, I'll mention it in a second. <laughs> yeah. I'll mention it in a second. <laughs> um, what about the doctor when he's he's wearing his mask the whole time, which is brilliant, because the first time he's wearing his mask and talking to Dr. Reeves, the surgeon is wearing his mask, talking to Dr. Reeves, explaining what the surgery is going to be like and he's wearing his mask and you're like why is this guy wearing a mask like i i get that he's just about to go into surgery but they really make it a point to show the mask like he has a close-up and he's wearing the mask and then at the end of the surgery he takes off the mask and it's the same actor that plays the great judge Mm -hmm. in the other world little little wizard of oz uh nod there so yeah so i feel like it's kind of like people always use that as their argument that was real too yeah i'm not gonna accept any different no that's (laughs) great <laughs> it's but, real okay so chess he goes D- uh do you play chess mon ami mm-hmm. and he goes like oh yeah i do and i'm like seven seal <laughs> tying it all back in i think that's it our is. third or fourth tie in this episode look at us look yeah. at us it's all connected so i know i forgot to mention ping pong because you mentioned ping pong and i said i was going to get back to it <laughs> so there is a um just talking about Jack Cardiff of like what an ambitious first movie to DP, but like the way in that one shot when they are playing ping pong and he literally whips the camera mm-hmm. to keep the ball in, like Incredible. what an ambitious thing, especially with a technic, a huge technicolor camera. That is so crazy. Like he's just going all out on this movie. He is so unbelievably ambitious. This has to be one of the great like cinematographer debuts of mm-hmm. all time. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I heard that they had like ping pong pros come in and train uh, Roger Livesey and And Kim Kim Hunter. Hunter, Yeah. You know what else else Kim Hunter is known for? What? Planet of the Apes, the first three or four. And as an ape. She won an Oscar for Streetcar. Yeah, she's great. I love her. Yeah, she's great in that movie. Yeah. Uh, I also love those original Planet of the Apes movies. Um, yeah, you can tell that they brought someone in because they're really good at ping pong. And like, <laughs> I'm sure you could, if not being taught properly, they would have ruined a lot of takes with like someone hits it and then it just goes flying and they can't hit it. Yeah, they can't volley. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Anyway, should we do uh, sight and sound? Let's do it. All right. So what was your favorite sight? I have a feeling we have the f- same favorite sight because how can you not have this? Hmm, I'm curious. I don't know if you have mine. Let's just both stare at each other until one of us cracks. <laughs> you can't blank either. You just blanked. You lost. <laughs> um, 
it's the scene where the conductor conductor nope. 70 it's not the one nope conductor 71 comes down and i think he's just said his technicolor line and there's this like mystical kind of pan through the flowers you don't even and then you end up with june and peter at their picnic but it's one of those beautiful shots where it's like by the time you get to the end you don't remember where you started and it's just it's off put like it's like it's off putting you're you're literally in this like hazy fantasy dreamland and you land on them yeah that was a real that was a standout moment to me it's, it's a beautiful, great it's a beautiful i thought that image. was i thought that was yours too so mine there's so many to pick from it could be it the was first, hard it could be the first time you see kim hunter mine it is great i'm gonna go with so when you first see roger livesey Aww. and he has his camera obscura on this table right and kim hunter's coming and he turns off the camera obscura. So it goes from being this dark room with this camera obscura in the middle, turns it off, and then you see this yellow light that comes in through the windows, and then he opens the doors. That's my and second have, favorite. And it's like you go from this like dark room with the camera obscura to this yellow light to this yeah. then natural light. Yeah, that's like, my second favorite. What a what a feat to pull that off. Because again, if you if you've made a movie before, you know that that light doesn't come naturally. You're, people are lighting as people are turning lights on and off at specific times, at, timing it perfectly. And the camera has to be exposed to each of the different lighting setups. And the fact that he makes it look so smooth, that's almost like another show off moment. I yeah. feel like on Jeff, Jack Cardiff's part. Yeah. Beautiful. It is beautiful. I love how he like watches her for a second. He through the door frame. Oh yeah. It's so great. It's a little searchers action. Maybe now. pre-searchers. <laughs> <Yep>. Pre-searchers. <laughs> searchers. <laughs> What's your favorite sound? Um, my favorite sound is the piano. It's the score when they first get to the afterlife. I love that. I, I I mentioned it. It's earlier. it's like you did, you did. It's like it's, before we started recording. You did because it's kind of um. It's not sad. It's just it's it's a little solemn, but it's mm-hmm. magical. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I um, also there's a line that happens just before that where two Americans come in, and this is their exchange. And one guy's like, "I wish I could make a phone call," and the other guy, the other guy goes, "From here, that'd be long distance." It's, from here, that'd be long distance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish I could make a phone call. From here, that'd be long distance. I love all Americans in Powell at Pressburger movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, my what was favorite your, sound. What was your favorite sound? Livesy, baby. Livesy. It's gotta be Livesy. It is um, when he's giving like kind of his final um, speech, like at the trial. He says, uh, he says this. Here in this tier. <laughs> Here in this tier. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Wait, wait, no, you didn't listen. You have to listen. Here in this tier are love and truth and friendship. That whole line. Here in this tier are love and f- truth and friendship, but it's mostly <laughs> here in this tier. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a sucker for rhymes. Rain in the sp- sp- Spain the in the rain. rain. In the rain Spain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, British people. So I guess this is the moment, this is the time when we would normally do a segment that we do called Pauline Says, where we read a Pauline Kale uh-huh. review of the film. Uh-huh. Could not find one for this. No! I don't I don't know that she reviewed it. Obviously, it came out before she was reviewing, um, and I don't know that she ever returned to it. So no Pauline Kale for this one. But that means we can go directly into our letterboxed segment where we pull up Mostly negative letterboxed reviews. <laughs> we do some positive ones. We do. We throw a couple positive in there. I'm going to start with an easy one. This one speaks to me very much so. I feel seen. Uh, four and a half stars. Roger Livesey, hold me, please. A... I get it. Come on. I want that from um, Kathleen Byron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, and I love the flirtation with her and Bob. It's so cute. I love because Black Narcissus was their movie after this. Yeah. So I love that they 
had her in this in this very small yes. kind of but seminal role. Yes. And then like, okay, for the next movie, you're going to be you're like. You're going to be, yeah, yeah, like the villain, yeah. kind of. Yeah, she is the villain. Yeah, but also she's or is misunderstood. The, or is the villain God? Is the, yes. is the villain the mountain? Is the villain isolation Yeah, in Black Narcissus? Yes. Oh, what a good movie. It's one of my favorites. So this is a two-star review. We're back to a matter of life and death now. Uh, the first few minutes are stupendous, but it takes a sharp nosedive when it decides to go the uh, it's all in his head route. Mm. The Technicolor looks great, though. It's mm. fair. Yeah. Listen, that's fair. Um, half a star. I wouldn't trust anyone who says they love this train wreck of a film, <laughs> especially if they have it in their top four or something like that. What an absolute disgrace to cinema. <laughs> Jesus. You know, to be like, there are very, very few bad reviews. Yes, very on, few. I uh, bet you Letterboxd. that this is probably the lowest one. That person. This was is probably, the worst one I could find. They were probably cheated on or broken up with, broken up by someone who has this on their top four. On yeah, Letterboxd. that must be. Yeah, or story. maybe someone who's in the British uh, Royal Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two stars. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Life or death is what you would get if the world's stuffiest Vicar saw <laughs> The Wizard of Oz and decided to make a movie about British-American relations after World War II. <laughs> and yes, this movie is just as fun as that description makes it sound. <laughs> They're really selling what? it short here. Um, they say every character is either a cliche or a Halloween costume, and it makes any <laughs> message the movie attempts to have feel like the moral of a Christmas pageant. <laughs> They go on to say, I did enjoy the changing between black and white and Technicolor, but that gimmick alone couldn't carry the whole film. Wow. An unfortunately boring movie from a time when the world was anything but boring. What? <laughs> See, the movie is so not boring. We say that every week no, about every movie. No, some movie. of them are a little boring. I'm afraid. I'm afraid next week's might be. I haven't seen it in a long time. <laughs> we'll Only time will tell. Uh, four and a half stars. Maybe love isn't a sham? <laughs> I like that one. Someone just gave it to, oh, two and a half. And this is a question. They just asked the hokiest archers film. <laughs> and yeah, sure. Yeah. What's wrong with that? I wouldn't call it hokey though. That's derogative. No. Is it the sappiest archers film? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Four and a half stars. I'd forgotten. There's like a full 10 minute aside about how every country has a reason to hate the English. Lol. <laughs> We didn't talk about that. Right. It is ridiculous. It's so funny. The the um the Lexington and Concord guy, the uh-huh. prosecution. Raymond Massey. He <laughs> No, I'm just gonna call him Lexington and Concord. <laughs> he has chosen the jury and he chooses people that all come from a nation that has like has really beef. bad relations with the British. Yeah. It's really ballsy, like for yeah. them to do that. One guy is Indian, one guy's Irish. Yeah. Um, one guy's French, but that's just like they literally just have wars. <laughs> Who are the others? Oh, the something about the um the war that's in Colonel Blimp. God, it's it's slipping my mind. But yeah, I thought that that was really yeah, it ballsy was, of it them. Was. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I loved that. Um last one for me five stars good old-fashioned christian sexting (laughs) (laughs) no there's no sexting come on be classy people i know um well that was a matter of life and death did you did you have any Uh, there was one thing i realized the movie ends with him waking up and saying we won and she goes i know darling and I just realized, like, I think he's also talking about the war. Because sure. this is, like, right after the war ended. It's and meant to still be it's ambiguous. It's really sweet. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. It's nice. Yeah. But they also won the trial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next week, we will be discussing Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin from 1925. This is a film school classic. If you ever went to film school at all or took any film classes, you probably saw this. It's on the shorter side. I think it's like 75 minutes long, so not too crazy. This is a look, this is a this is a big deal in uh number 11. <laughs> Jackie was uh motioning uh two two index fingers for 11. <laughs> yes, this is number 11. So we'll be back up at the top next week and we hope that you all join us. Mm-hmm. Until then, this is Greg signing off. Jackie signing off. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. 
Seen and Heard is presented by the Arroyo Film Club, produced by and starring Greg Kleinschmidt and Jacqueline Bastagian. Edited by Greg Kleinschmidt. Music by Andrew Cox. Special thanks to Catherine Ferenczak.